Come on, somebody make some noise for Jesus if you're glad to be in church in the house of the Lord. He's worthy, amen. And can we one more time just honor all the mamas in the house? Happy Mother's Day. Happy, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to my mom. Happy Mother's Day to my wife, Katie. I honor you, love you. Happy Mother's Day to you. It's a good day to be in church, Hilliard, Short North, Polaris, Whitehall, our Grand Lake launch team gathered in Salina, Ohio. Welcome. Those tuned in on television, online, or joining us from a prison, a correctional facility all across the nation right now, we welcome you. We welcome you. Especially uh, to all the mamas watching from behind bars today, a very special happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you. I hope you know how loved you are, how blessed you are, and how much this church loves you and we honor you. Why don't you turn to somebody, tell them it's good to see him in church today at every location, and you can go ahead and have a seat. You know, we're walking through the miracles of Jesus recorded in the book of John, uh, miracle by miracle, in order that they appear. I do think, though, it's fitting that this week on Mother's Day, we would be uh, learning from Jesus' sixth miracle sign recorded in the book of John when he opens the eyes of a blind man. Matter of fact, the, the Bible that I'm reading from uh, over my John chapter 9, verse 1 through 12, I'm not sure what Bible you're reading from, but if you look in your Bible over John chapter 9, verse 1 through 12, you probably see a similar header as what is in my Bible. Mine says this, Jesus heals a man born blind. This is the Bible I studied from this week. There, there, there's another header right to the right of that caption. There, there's a little commentary in my Bible that says, now... I see. Now I see. I, I don't know about you. I just kind of thought it was a, a little bit comical that we would be talking about a blind man on Mother's Day because you do know it has been scientifically proven that if a man and a woman both fall off a cliff at the same time, the woman will always hit the ground first. And that's because the man will find a way to get lost on his way down scientifically proven. Matter of fact, so is this. Um, nothing is truly lost until a mom can't find it. If mom can't find it, it's gone. It ain't coming back. If mom can't find it, if, if, if anybody in the house goes to search for said lost whatever, it still might be in the house. But if mom says it's gone, come on somebody, it's gone. I'd only been married a few short uh, years my wife was nine months and one week pregnant with our first daughter, Morgan. This was May 13th, 2007. Uh, Morgan was born on May 21st, just eight days later, two weeks late from her due date. And it's Mother's Day, and uh, we had a good day. I mean, it was a, just a normal kind of good Mother's Day, normal day kind of day. At the end of the night, we crawl in bed together, and um, I noticed something off about my wife. And so I, I said, baby, what's wrong? And she did not reply. And I said, what is going on? And she would not let on. And finally I said, honey, what did I do? Clearly you're mad. What did I do? And she turned around and she said, it's not what you did. It's what you did not do. I said, what did I not do? She said, it's mother's day. You've never once said happy mother's day. I looked at her I said, but you're not my mother. <laughs> Two captions, a man born blind, and now I see. Come on, somebody. Matter of fact, if you want to know, what did I underline in that commentary on the right side of my Bible? I underlined these words, the man did not know. And every man said, amen. Come on, all the men said, Amen. We don't know till we know. Come on. We don't know what we don't know till we know. And I just wanted to help somebody because that might be 
I also just wanted to make something clear. Um, coming out of last week's message, I misspoke on something, and uh, I want to just clear up something I misspoke on. And uh, so this this is a, a a man admitting that he made a mistake last week. I just want you to know. In studying the the miracle of Jesus walking on water, I mentioned the men in the boat with Jesus, and I mentioned what was Luke thinking in the boat with Jesus. And I just want y'all to know Luke was not in the boat with Jesus. He was not an apostle. He was not an eyewitness to Jesus. He had access to the apostles. He traveled with the apostle Paul, but he would not have been in the boat, and I knew that. But my mom called me after the service, and she said, are you an idiot? (laughs) And I said, no, mom. I don't think so. And she said, well, you sure sounded like one today. (laughs) No, she didn't say that. I'm just kidding. My mom would never have said that. I just thought that would be funny to to say my mom said on Mother's Day. Luke, Luke is considered to be one of the earliest of, of Christianity's historians. I just wanted to make sure you all know that I misspoke. I got a little carried away in that story, and I said Luke was in the boat. He was not in the boat. Now, as I was preparing better for this sermon, come on, somebody, I, I was studying just a little harder after I realized I, I misspoke last week. I was looking at not just the miracle of Jesus opening the eyes of the man born blind in this passage, but I, I, was, I was studying the miracle of sight. How many of you know just the fact that we can see today, that's a miracle in and of itself. Like when you really understand the miracle of sight. And one thing that I learned that I did not realize is every man is born legally blind. Every woman is born legally blind. An infant, when an infant is born, has only about not 20-20 vision, but about 2200 vision, which means that a newborn can only see something just, just about 12 inches or closer to his or her face which is why physical touch is so important in the developmental stages, those early year, uh, months and days and months of a child's development. It actually takes a newborn about 18 months to begin to fully see clearly. And as I studied this, one thing that stood out to me was that the first image a child develops around the, the, the six-month mark or so is the image of mom. And just a few months later, dad comes next, but mom comes first. And it's during the the first like 18 months or so of a child's development that that their sight is being fully formed. And it's something called synaptogenesis, where, where the visual cortex peaks at around three months and these connections are being made between the visual cortex and the optical nerve and all of these connections between our eyes and our brain, which gives us the ability to see. And what's really interesting is that if you were to take a fully healthy newborn and if you were to place a patch over one of that newborn's eyes and leave that patch there for the first few years of that child's life, that child would be forever blind from that eye because what ophthalmologists say is this, the the natural window for the development of that child's sight because you kept that child's sight covered for those developmental years, that child would never, ever be able to see. It is irreparable. It is irreversible. And so I tell you that because for this man to be healed from Jesus, he was born blind multiple times in the gospels. Jesus heals a person with blindness, but this is the only time that we have recorded where Jesus actually heals a person who was born blind that 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 natural window for development of sight has been forever gone it is irreversible it is irreparable and i just got to thinking about when your condition is irreversible when you're in a situation that's irreparable isn't that when god does his greatest miracle work come on some of you know it because you've experienced it but i'm telling you when you're in a moment where, you, where you're absolutely, it's, it's just irreparable. There, there's no hope for you. There's no help but from God. That's when God does his greatest work. Like he did for Abram and Sarah who were well past their prime and the natural window for the development of a child had been forever shut and yet God provides a miracle son like only God can. And so if you're believing God for a miracle, just know He can. Amen? Amen. Only God 
can. So let's read from John chapter nine. And again, I'm gonna save this week all the fill-ins until the very end. So if you're frustrated throughout this message, I just want this passage to speak to us first. I wanna just kind of walk through this slowly and then I'm gonna rush all the fill in the blanks at the very end. But I wanna start with John chapter nine, verse one. It says, as Jesus went along, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. As he went along, he sees a man that cannot see him as he went along. And if you understand the context of this passage, he's likely not just moving along at a normal pace. He's likely moving along at an incredible pace because right before we get to this miracle moment, Jesus makes an incredible statement in John chapter eight, verse 12. He's kind of going back and forth with some of the religious leaders and he makes this statement. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, the Pharisees are over the top mad at Jesus. They're challenging Jesus, and Jesus pushes right back at them. He does not back down because he's Jesus. And what makes Jesus Jesus is Jesus is a strong man, always strong, but he's a right man. He's always right. The Pharisees were strong men, but they weren't always right. Can I get an amen? You can be strong, but not right sometimes. You can be right, but not strong sometimes. Jesus is Jesus because he's strong and he's right. And the religious leaders can't stand him, so they're pushing back and they challenge him and they bring up Abraham. And Jesus goes, oh, you want to talk about Abraham? Abraham was a fan of me. Matter of fact, Abraham's super excited to see me. He could not wait. And they're like, how can you talk about Abraham like you know Abraham? Jesus, you're not even 50 years old. Abraham lived a long time ago. You don't know Abraham. And Jesus just throws it down. He says, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. Even throws grammar out the window. I, 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 that, I bet you'd get it wrong on, a, on an English test if you wrote that statement. I am. And the Bible says that at this, they picked up stones to stone Jesus. They wanted to kill Jesus, but Jesus hid himself and he slipped away from the temple grounds. Now, what do we know about men born blind, about blind men or blind women in the scripture? They tended to stick close to the temple because that was a place where people were constantly coming and going and their only hope to really make it in life was to sit and to beg, hoping that somebody might drop them a coin in their hand or give them a piece of bread to eat. This man was likely not very far from the temple, not very far from the crowd that has literally just tried to kill Jesus. And so I just want you to imagine Jesus isn't just moving along. He's moving quickly along, but not quick enough to miss an opportunity to help somebody who's in need. And I just think that's a great challenge for the church, we live in a day and in an age where everything is moving quickly. We want what we want and we want it right now. And we're always moving to the next thing. We're always on our way to some place. But, but, but might we miss some moments where Jesus actually wanted to use us in, the, in a miracle moment for somebody? Aren't we called to be the hands and feet of Jesus? Aren't we called to bring help and hope and healing to a world in desperate need? And how many needs might we not even see because we're moving along too quickly to see them. Jesus is never too in a hurry to stop and to help someone in need. His disciples, on the other hand, what they see is not an opportunity to bring a cure to a man who was born blind. They find this as an opportunity to criticize this man born blind by asking Jesus this question, Rabbi, who sinned? Did this man sin or did his parents sin that he was born blind? Like there must be some reason he's suffering. And I want you to notice what Jesus says because he could have Jesus, because he's Jesus, he could have settled once and for all one of the greatest questions of all time. How can God, if God is good, allow so much pain and suffering in the world? Because he's Jesus, he could have preached the greatest sermon ever preached. And we could just re-preach Jesus' sermon, answer the question, Jesus. But what Jesus does is he says this, neither this man nor his parents sinned 
said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus doesn't go back to Genesis chapter three and explain how because one man sinned, sin entered the world and now all men have sin in us and because we live in a world that's been marred and scarred by sin, we've got to deal with all the sorts of things we've got to deal with. He could have, but he did not. What Jesus does and says instead is he says, look, just because somebody is sick or suffering, it doesn't mean you can draw a direct connection to something that person did to cause their disability to cause their situation. Sometimes we cause our situation. Sometimes we cause our disability. Sometimes we make really dumb decisions. We, we, we make really poor decisions and, and we become disabled. We become, uh, we become marred and we have to walk with the, 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 the result of our sinfulness. And when, when I say walk disabled, I mean, if you drive drunk and you, you get in an accident and you break both your legs, you're walking disabled, not because it just happened, but because you were dumb and you drove drunk. Amen. Amen. So sometimes we can draw a direct connection, but Jesus is saying, don't let's not get caught in this sort of thing where we're always looking at each other and wondering, what did you do? What did he do? What he does go on to say is, as long as it is day, we must do. If you want to talk about what should we do or what did he do or what did his parents do, let's do this. We need to be doing the works of him who sent me. And the reason we need to be doing the work of the father is because night is coming when no one can work. Life is short. So as long as you have life, you need to live your life to the full. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. Make the greatest difference you can make because there's a time and a day coming when you're not going to have the opportunity to. The only chance and the only time we have to make a difference that will last forever in the life of somebody else is here and now. And we're not promised tomorrow. I don't know if I have tomorrow, but I know what I have, I have right now. And so Jesus says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He says who he is again. Now, because we have Jesus, I just want to draw this parallel to Matthew chapter five, because we have Jesus. Jesus says of you and of me, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, in the same way that you've seen me shine my light, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. I am the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Now, back to the man born blind. When Jesus had said these things, he spat on the ground, which is a, just a nicer way of saying he spit on the ground. <laughs> Jesus spat and he made clay with his saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, one question is, why did he make spit dirt, spit mud to put on this man's face? Most Theologians see this as a throwback or a direct connection to the creation account in Genesis chapter three, and not just the part where God formed man from the dust and from the clay of the earth and breathed the breath of life into man, but even farther back before that, because of what Jesus has just made the claim about himself in Genesis one, verse three, and God said, let there be light. And there was light there. They they see this as a sort of a connection to both passages in Genesis one and in Genesis two. This claim that Jesus made, I am the light of the world. And this same claim now being made, that which was used to bring order to the chaos at the dawn of creation in Genesis 1 is now causing synaptogenesis to take place in the eyes and in the mind of a man who's never before been given the ability to see. And as Jesus spits in the dirt and he makes mud, he he puts that, he anoints this man's eyes with the mud that he's made. Now, if it's not just to draw a connection back to Genesis, and perhaps it is to draw connection back to Genesis, but maybe there's more reasons why Jesus chooses this method for the miracle. One reason may be also that because this man has lived without sight for his entire life, he's learned to live by his other senses. 
If you don't have your sight, your hearing tends to be much more keen than, than most other people's sense of hearing. Your, your ability to, to, to feel and to touch is heightened because you don't have the ability to see. And I just wonder if Jesus uses this method so that the man can first hear Jesus spit onto the ground. And in the moment he hears Jesus spit, I can imagine in his heart and in his mind, he's thinking, you know what? This man isn't here to help me. I can imagine his heart has the opportunity to sink. Here's just somebody else who's come along to disparage me. I can imagine when Jesus places the spit dirt on his face, he's thinking, yep, I was right. He's only trying to embarrass me. And because I can't imagine it stayed in place for very long, not only could he hear it being made, could he feel it being placed, but perhaps he could taste it. And in that moment, I can imagine his heart sinks a bit deeper. And he's got every reason to be disappointed, every reason to be let down, offended and hurt by Jesus. I don't know why Jesus chose the mud in the way that he did, but I do know that we tend to want to focus on the method that Jesus used. But what we need to focus on is the power of Jesus to change lives because the power of God is the point. Let him do what he wants to do, how he wants to do it. Like so many miracles before this one, there's a human element, there's a list of instructions where Jesus tells this man now with spit mud on his face to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. A blind man with mud in his eyes being sent on a mission. Warren Worsby offers an interesting explanation. He says one reason for the clay perhaps was irritation that it encouraged the man to believe and to obey. For if you've ever had an irritation in your eyes, you know how quickly you would seek irrigation to cleanse it out. You might compare this irritation to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit as he uses God's law to bring the lost sinner under judgment. Perhaps Jesus was just prodding this man along. Or perhaps the reason or also the reason could be that because this man had been born blind and he was not able to take care of himself, but only likely to beg, Jesus is giving him an opportunity to participate in something great. I've been to Israel four times and I've, I've been to Hezekiah's tunnel. I've, I've, I've seen where the pool of Siloam would, would have been. And, and you, you, you would have had, this man blind would have had to, to make his way down so many crowded corridors filled with people who would have recognized him and now seed, seeing the man born blind that they knew and recognized with mud in his eyes and on his face. Face, he would have had to have walked down crowded corridors, hundreds of steps down and through these crowded passageways before he could have reached the pool. We don't know if he had help or not. We don't know if he made his way on his own or not. But what we do know is that this man was given an opportunity by Jesus to literally put to practice, I'm walking by faith and not by sight. I'm walking by faith and not by sight. I'm going to do what I've been told by God to do. So he went and he washed because there must be something about Jesus, the way he approached the man, the way he spoke to the man, the way he touched the man, the way he instructed the man that he thought I better go ahead and listen. The Bible says he came back seeing. He came back seeing. Now, now, if that were the end of the story, I, I'd say, great story. Come on, somebody. Great story. But it's not the end. Verse 8. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? How then were your eyes open? He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and he put it on my eyes and he told me to go to Siloam and to wash. So I went and I washed, then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know. 
Think about this. He was blind when Jesus sent him away. How's he going to know where Jesus is? I don't know where he went after. He told me to come here. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been born blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed it, now I see. Some of the Pharisees said of Jesus, this man is not from God, or he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? How can a sinner do this? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. And he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Amen. Come on, make some noise if you were blind, but now you see. One thing I see in this passage is I see this man's faith growing moment by moment. Because the first time they ask him what happened and who gave you your sight back, his reply is, well, the man they called Jesus spit in some mud and put it on my face and told me to go and wash. And so I did what they, that man that they called Jesus told me to do and, and he changed my life. It sort of reminds me of so many who the moment you first encounter Jesus for the first time, he saves you, he forgives you. Theologically, you might not can win a debate with anybody. Maybe you've never even opened the scripture before. You, you just know I've encountered the living God. Something changed inside of me. I'm different. I was one way before Jesus. I know I'm a different person today. I might not can teach a Bible school class yet. Come on, somebody. But I know that he changed my life. And I love how this man born blind who was healed by Jesus gives us a perfect example for how to share the faith. Because some of you, you've been saved and you're like, I don't know how to share my faith with family, with friends, with classmates, with, with coworkers. I don't have an answer to all the spiritual and biblical and theological questions that people might ask. So what? Just tell them what Jesus did for you. That's what he's telling these religious people. I, I can't win a theological debate with some religious people, but what I can tell you is I've encountered Jesus. I can tell you what he's done for me. I can tell you how he set me free. I can tell you that he changed my life. And then I see his faith grow even more as he's being pushed and pressed. Because it's when we're pushed and pressed that our faith begins to grow. And, and he goes on from saying, well, I'll tell you, it's the man they call Jesus to, well, he's a prophet. Since you asked me again, now that I think about it, he's a prophet, which means prophecy always means to declare the plans and the purposes of God. Prophecy has to do with the word of God. So this man's faith has shifted from it's the man they call Jesus. He's the one who healed me. He's the one who touched me to now I can trust his word. Word. I'm going to do what he told me to do. I can take him at his word. He didn't just touch me, but he gave me a truth that set me free. He's not just someone who touched me. He's someone I can trust. And so they pushed him and they pressed him more and more. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? And then he invites them to become a disciple. You want to be a follower of Jesus too? They hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow Jesus, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Hallelujah. To this they replied, yeah, well, you were steeped in sin 
from birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out because they had nothing else to say but to criticize the man. I got nothing for you. Get out of here. You, you, you've been a horrible person ever since the day that you were born. And what's just happened is that this man who's done lived his whole life as a reject, as an outcast, who's finally received his sight for the first time is being kicked out of a synagogue, which was not just a place for people to worship. It was a spiritual and a social and a cultural center for every Jew. And once you've been excommunicated, no Jew would have been permitted to, to be within six feet of anyone who'd been kicked out of the synagogue. And so in, a, in, in an instant, you have this man who finally, after living like an isolated reject for all his life, he's finally able for the first time to be among the people, to be a regular old Joe, come on, to be a part of the family. Now he's living again in loneliness and isolated and, he, and he's being rejected because he testifies of Jesus. It's a terrible, terrible thing to have happened to this man who's just received his sight. And so when Jesus heard that they threw him out, Jesus went out to look for him. And when he found him, he asked him this question. He said, do you believe in the son of man? Amen. Who is he, sir? The man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. From a man they call Jesus to he's a prophet, to you are Lord. I believe in you so much so that I will worship you. Then Jesus, he closes this chapter, but not the moment. Jesus says, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. Now, this is the end of chapter nine, but you're never going to really understand what Jesus is talking about here until you move on into the next chapter. I've got to ask the question, what does this miracle teach us about Jesus? Let me give you a few thoughts and then we're going to move into this next chapter in closing. The first thing that we learn about Jesus is that Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And whoever believes and ever, whoever follows Jesus will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do you know Jesus? Do you have the light of life living and dwelling inside of you? Have your spiritual eyes been opened? Do you know what it means to walk in darkness? Are you walking in darkness right now, but you don't even know that you're walking in darkness right now? Romans 3 23 says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6 23 says and the wage of sin is death but the gift of God is everlasting life in Christ Jesus our Lord 2 Corinthians 4 4 tells us that the God of this age who is the devil has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ the perfect image of God you look at John chapter 8 and John chapter 9 and John chapter 10, you, you see what Jesus says in John 8, 34 of sin. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. And a slave has no permanent place in the family. But a son, say a son. But a son belongs to the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This isn't 
just a miracle story to show us that Jesus has power to give sight to the physically blind. This is a miracle story meant to remind us and to show us that Jesus and only Jesus has power to give sight to the spiritually blind, Amen. to open spiritual eyes. And again, the end of chapter nine isn't going to make sense until you move into chapter 10. Let me read to you just some of chapter 10 where Jesus goes on, because this isn't a scene change. He doesn't go any place, he's still teaching. Very truly, I tell you, said Jesus, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from a stranger because they don't recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. This isn't the story of a blind man. It's the story of blind men. We miss the forest for the trees when we think that Jesus is only concerned with giving physical sight to a man born blind, though he uses this miracle moment as an opportunity to make an even bigger point. And the Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he's a demon possessed and raving mad man. Why listen to Jesus? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Jesus' bigger point is this, yes. We are all born legally blind and the only one with power to open our eyes is Jesus we are all born spiritually blind and the only one with power to open our spiritual eyes is Jesus because of sin and because of sin because we've all sinned we are all slaves to sin but through faith in Jesus and by the grace of of God we are made sons and daughters of God come on from slave to son from slave to daughter just as the crowds were divided that day I'm sure there's a division happening in this place right now and from wherever you're watching from because you have to make a decision you have to have an answer to the question what do you say of Jesus who do you say Jesus is some said he's a raving lunatic others said no I'm going with Lord on this one what do you say of Jesus who said in John 14 I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father in heaven but through me do you say of Jesus who in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 it says salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved there's power in the name what do you say of Jesus who said of himself in John 10 9 I am the gate whoever enters through me will be saved what do you say of Jesus 
In Romans 10, 13, it says, everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus will be saved. What do you say of Jesus? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be forgiven? Do, do, do you want the light of life living and dwelling inside of you the way Jesus promised to give life to you? If only you would put your faith and trust in him. So I'm gonna ask you to bow your head and to close your eyes and I, I wanna give opportunity to every person in this room, every person in every room, in every space, you want to be forgiven. You want to be filled with the light and the life of Jesus Christ. Say, Jesus, I need you. I trust you as Lord and as Savior of my life. Forgive me of my sin. I turn from sin. I turn to you, to you alone. And I receive from you now eternal life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give sight to these spiritually blind eyes that I may see the light of the gospel that displays the perfect image of God to Christ Jesus, my Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, can we honor Jesus in the house? I love this man's response because it's the same response of the men in the boat we looked at last week. Mine is Luke, of course. They worshiped him. And I think about that worship moment and what that worship moment might have looked like. I think it's an appropriate and expected response for somebody who's just had their eyes opened by Jesus. Yeah, I think that's a good response. You should worship him. But then I think about the many who have yet to receive the miracle that they've been believing and asking God for and how greater that worship. Frances Jane Crosby wrote more than 9,000 hymns throughout her life. She wrote so many hymns that she, she started using a surname because she was convinced that every hymn book would be filled with only her name. She'd written so many, so she started writing by different names and what people don't know blessed assurance is a song that she wrote a hymn that she wrote many, many people don't know that she was blind from nearly birth she was sick at the age of about six weeks old and she lost her sight at the age of six weeks and lived her entire life unable to see one well-meaning preacher said to francis i think it's a great pity that the master did not give you the gift of sight when he has so surely showered you with so many other gifts. She looked back at the preacher and she said this, do you know that if at birth I had been able to make one petition, it would have been that I was born blind? Because when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. The first poem she ever wrote at the age of eight, eight years old. Oh, what a happy soul I am, though I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. An eight-year-old blind girl wrote that. She wrote this hymn. Some of you might know this hymn. So if you know this hymn, let's sing it together. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life in atonement for sin. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the 
Jesus. 